Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing B2 gold stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. B2 Gold is a Canadian mining company that owns and operates gold mines in Mali, Namibia, and the Philippines. The company is headquartered in Vancouver and was founded in 2007. It's listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, and Namibian Stock Exchange. But we're going to look at the ticker that trades on the New York Stock Exchange since the company reports its financials in US dollars. The company's first two gold mines came about in 2009 from the acquisition of the Toronto Stock Exchange listed and financially distressed company Central Sun Mining. Their third gold mine came about from the merger in 2012 from CJ Mining, which was listed on an Australian stock exchange. Their fourth mine came from the merger with Toronto Stock Exchange listed Oryx Gold. All four mines produced half a million ounces of gold in 2015. Their fifth mine came from the merger with Australian Stock Exchange listed Papillon Resources. All five of their mines produced 1 million ounces of gold in 2018 and also in 2019. Let's get started with the model. 5.4 billion market cap, they're trading at $5 a share, and they have 1 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company had negative free cash flow in 2017, but it's growing each year, up to half a billion in the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's also growing from 57 million to 430 million. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that grows nicely as well from 600 million to 1.5 billion. The company also has really good net profit margins. Net profit margin is net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. In the trailing 12 months, they converted 30% of their revenue into profit, which means 70% went towards expenses. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales, below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The difference between those two numbers is their gross profit. Their gross profit grows nicely each year. Below that is their operating expenses. Example of an operating expense is depreciation. Below that is operating income, and they are positive in growing operating income each year. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt. Then there's other income and expenses. Sometimes companies make money or lose money outside of their core operations, so that has to go into other. Below that is their pre-tax income, then their taxes. So they have nice growing net income each year. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from their operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. And this company has a pretty good amount of capex each year. Operating cash flow minus capex gives you your free cash flow. And free cash flow is the cash that's remaining to pay a dividend, which this company does, buy back stock, which it doesn't look like they do, pay down debt, which it looks like they do, or invest back into their business, which they're definitely doing. That's why they're growing so much. You can see the company had negative free cash flow in 2017. That's why they took out over $200 million of debt just to run their business. The following year, they paid down as much debt as they issued. And after that, they paid down more debt than they issued. You may be wondering why they took out so much debt in the trailing 12 months when they had over $400 million of free cash flow. It's very likely they're looking to acquire another company or acquire some more mines, so they need some money on their balance sheet to do that. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. If you cannot generate positive cash flow from your core business, you don't have much of a business. This company generates positive and growing operating cash flow each year, up to almost $800 million. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is accounting profit and loss. There's a lot of non-cash items on the income statement. 
And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, which is 450 million. Then you have to adjust for the non-cash items. They had $291 million of depreciation. This is a non-cash expense that brings down your net income, but it doesn't affect cash flow. So you have to add it back on the CFO section. They had 95 million of deferred taxes. They also had 19 million of stock-based compensation and 38 million in changes in working capital. So even though their company reported $450 million of profit, they actually generated $770 million of cash flow. Let's look at the capital structure. $2 billion of equity, $260 million of debt. So they're 89% equity, 11% debt. Their net debt is $121 million, and their WAC is 12%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimate a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's $9 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $7.7 .7 billion. We divide that by 1 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 732. They're trading at 513, so they're trading at a 30% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is higher than me. They're at 975 a share, so they're saying the stock is even more undervalued. So it looks like the stock has been doing pretty well the past few years. It did take a dip at one point. It looks like back in March when the market crashed, but it came all the way back up past its all-time highs. But it looks like it's been coming down a little the past few weeks. This company started paying a dividend. They pay a 2.15% dividend yield. And they pay out 27% of their net income, 26% of their free cash flow. Their beta is 1.27, so the stock moves a little more than a market. The stock has outperformed the S&P 500, up 20% in the past 52 weeks, compared to the S&P 500, which is up 16% in the same time frame. The 52-week low was $2, the high was $7.50. The stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average, so it seems to be in a downtrend. This is a pretty liquid stock. Seven to eight million shares are traded each day. And almost all the shares outstanding are on float. 72% are held by institutions and less than 1% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have more than doubled your money. That's a 7.7% annual return. BlackRock is the biggest shareholder at 11.5%, Van Van Eck at 10%, FMR, Renaissance, and Vanguard. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market's 10, the median is 14. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 12.5, so that means investors are paying $12.50 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 3.7, which is between the median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 2.6. So they're at the median. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They can easily cover their interest payments. ROE is net income over equity. They have a really good ROE at 21%. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They can cover their current liabilities two and a half times. And their current assets are 140 million of cash, 48 million of receivables, and 217 million of inventory. So the company does seem to be well capitalized. They have 450 million of free cash flow, 242 million of working capital, and 116 million dollar dividend payment. So they have almost 600 million dollars of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos of 10 companies in the same industry as BTG, and if BTG has number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they're better in PE and price of sales. They're at the average in price to book. They're pretty close to average at current ratio. They're doing much better than average in ROE. They're also doing well in debt at 11%, average is 19%. And they are a lot smaller than the average. The average company is 15 billion market cap. They're 5 billion. And they do pay a higher dividend than average, 2.15%. To summarize, I have them trading at a 30% discount. This company seems to be growing at a really rapid pace. Plus, they're dealing with gold, which is an important commodity. And if the dollar falls, which some people think it may, gold may spike up. I rank their free cash flows 8 out of 10. They seem to be growing at a pretty nice rate. I rank their revenue 9 out of 10. 
That's growing at a really nice rate. It more than doubles from 2017 to the trailing 12 months. And I ranked their ratios eight out of 10. They seem to have really good ratios. Plus the company started paying a dividend, so it seems like they're comfortable with their revenue streams. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.